very lucky that Ken's agreed to talk about his Boer War collection uh, for me and to show us a few of his favourite pieces that, that carry an interesting story. So could you tell us how you became interested in the Boer War, Kenneth? Yes. Um, many years ago, when the last enlightened head of BBC television was alive, I mean, you will, uh, he, he thought very highly of me as an actor, which I was entirely. And uh, so we spent quite a lot of time together. And he, one day, he got to know my various obsessions in life, which are very serious obsessions, Ireland being the most uh, notorious. I want to see the murdering English off that island once and for all. Uh, and of course, not many uh, British people can see what is so seeable. He asked me, he said, Kenneth, would you make a film for us, us being the BBC, on one of your enthusiasms? That's the word he used. And I said no three times um, over a period because uh, I said I'm not a filmmaker, I'm a film actor, I'm not a writer. And uh, he eventually brought in a living witness, uh, David Attenborough, who then was head of BBC Two, and they both said, though Hugh Weldon was my man, one of the best men I've ever met in my life, he said, Kenneth will pay you to try. You can go anywhere you like in the world, do what you like, we won't interfere. They were very enlightened days. Now, they are a creepy lot. BBC television, really creepy. Oh. Anyway, uh, in the end, I considered this extraordinary offer, and I had a friend from my childhood and uh, in the Air Force in the war, we were contemporaries, and uh, he lived in South Africa in a place called Ladysmith, the site of very famous military siege. Mm -hmm. So I accepted um, rather naughtily and didn't say why, because I could go and see my friend in Ladysmith, and uh, he it was who took me round the battlefields of Ladysmith, and uh, I began to face uh, what atrocities we British had performed there. It was quite a shock to me. I'd been aware of Ireland before, but not with the intensity of uh, the uh, the first-hand knowledge I saw when I was in Ladysmith. And um, what was most evocative to me, in retrospect, is that scattered over the copies, they call hills their copies, uh, were lone iron crosses, and on it would be engraved to a grey British soldier. And I asked the proper question to myself, what the hell were British soldiers buried on these? Of course, what I now know, it was Britain's extraordinary greed for money. That's why they died. No other reason. Power came into it. It's uh, the same reason that we were in our good cameraman's country, India. Uh, greed for money. Mm, I now boil it down to what St. Paul said, uh, love of money is the root to all evil. And that's true. They talk about the railways here just now, and their inadequacies. I am no that British businessmen, 95% of them, and the shareholders, would kill for money if they could be promised, or that it wouldn't be allowed even to enter their consciousness. Human beings most will do anything for money. 
Mm. So uh, it made a big impression upon me being on these battlefields and then beginning to inquire, being told by Peter Strong, that was my friend's name, he's dead now, he died quite young, um, he showed me, he had an opinion. I think he was a little disappointed that I didn't show more obvious interest, but I had a very deep interest, as I've just made clear. Uh, and then I began to read, and uh, I began to collect letters from the Boer War. But there's a purely, um, purely um, uh, collecting aspect to it, uh, uh, because most of the letters here, and there are about 30,000 in this room, five. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, it's the postal markings of the war. I'm making a study, all this written stuff, I've written hundreds of thousands of words about it. Now, that isn't for, you know, I'm better spent attacking the spirit of Britain over Ireland and over its imperial mentality that, thank God, it's getting rid of now. Uh, I, that's time better spent, but this is occupational therapy. It, um, when I was very ill a year ago, in great pain, mental pain because of the physical pain, this gave me relief because at three or four o'clock in the morning I could come up here and somehow the interest of what I'm researching overwhelmed my pain for up to two hours. Uh, and it's a wonderful gift to be given, to be interested, deeply interested in a subject. And I began to collect them. Today, this in this room, the director of the uh, Africana Museum in Johannesburg uh, and people from the Army Museum in South Africa, the director of our National Army Museum <laughs> will all tell you that this is the most comprehensive library on the second anglo Boer war that exists anywhere in the world. Uh, and so I don't have to go anywhere. I've got it all here. It's all in order, believe it or not. Uh, sometimes I lose things and can't find them. And those files there are, uh, are full of uh, these enormous quantity of uh, envelopes from to the Boer War for a study of whatever was on those envelopes. Yes, I understand you're working on an encyclopedia. Well, that's what I'm doing. Postal history. Of oh, that war, yeah. That war. But, uh, you, you know, I'm well aware that there might be 400 to 500 people around the world who'll be interested in it, no more. Mm -hmm. Because it's very specialized, very detailed. Ooh. That's are why. In, are you anywhere near completing it? No, impossible. Mm. Impossible. I seem to have a delusion when I was first started in about 1954 that I was immortal. Time was not a problem. I'm very well aware now that I'm... I hurry. I know I mustn't hurry, but I try to finish it. A section of it, the Natal campaign, were two separate campaigns. One called our soldiers the South African Field Force, and then the other campaign further uh, over into Africa um, to the east was the Natal campaign. I, I'm having a go to finish the Natal campaign, and I might finish that, but I need another 50 years to do the whole thing, and I ain't going to get it. I was 79 the other day. Yeah, well done, you. Yes, I had a very interesting experience. I traveled to Scotland on my birthday. And uh, my instinct, if I buy a newspaper, which I try and avoid, it takes up too much time, I listen to the news. And I bought the Times. I don't know why I did it. I 
by the Guardian uh, or the Independent, being a more liberal, radical person, and was the, the Times. And I was halfway to Scotland, and I turned the page when, to my astonishment, there was a photograph of me. And what it said was, Kenneth Griffith, that's me, is 79 today. <laughs> and, of course, there was no one on this train to Scotland I could tell. <laughs> you know, I wanted to say, hey, look at that, isn't that extraordinary? But I didn't. I've got enough cheek to do it, but they didn't look all that. That's a pity, that would have got a good laugh. You no, know, no. We've got an enormous number of models living there. And, uh, you know, this is not the place, perhaps, to give my definition of a model, but uh, cannot look or see beyond their noses. Just, I think, I think now we have a deadly uh, combination of two diseases. Greed and laziness. Uh, mm. The British. That's why the Asians are doing very well over here. Because they ain't got it yet. <laughs> Watch them. It's very infectious. Yeah. Now what do you want? Well, uh, I wonder if we might see some of your collection. Okay, yes, yeah, sure. Perhaps where you got them, what they mean to you, or how important they sure. are. Sure, well, you know, I'm working on these, uh, what I did, yes, writing here, notes. And they really are notes of all these group, the small group of, of um, covers, we call the envelopes. Mm. We serious collectors, covers. And uh, they're part of the section uh, that is connected with Durban. I see. Durban, in the war. Yeah. And very interesting because, um, um, no, Durban, ah, well, well, uh, it's difficult to, to, to explain, in, you know, in detail, but uh, Durban was one of the two main ports in South Africa. And uh, the main one used was Cape Town because the troop ships and the supply ships would uh, come down the west coast of Africa from Britain. And, uh, but, um, uh, uh, of course, they could also come through the Suez Canal. And uh, uh, the only connection that uh, the Boers, the heroes, as against us villains, except the poor soldier didn't bloody know. Uh, people like Salisbury and Chamberlain, Cecil Rhodes, those bastards knew what we were doing. And, uh, but we're not even clear about who are our heroes and who are our villains, are we? We are mm. such an ignorant pack. I'm not saying the French aren't equally uh, ignorant, and the Germans, and equally villainous. Yeah, yeah they, um, uh, that's not my prime concern. So, um, at Durban, when we overwhelmed the two Boer republics, uh, they had no access to the sea, except through uh, Lorenzo Marx, that is the um, that is the Portuguese colony at that time that gave them a sort of access into the Transvaal so that they could get supplies. But of course they were severely handicapped. Uh, and uh, Portugal, being part of this financial money grabbing lot of nations. Uh, for those reasons, they are referred to as Britain's oldest ally. So mm -hmm. they were not unprejudiced and did what they could to harm the independent republics, who we were attacking, incidentally, for one reason only, because there was gold under Johannesburg. 
and then President Kruger. That's why I am interested in this war. And the incidentals of it, which sort of saved my sanity, of being, even in the middle of great pain, being able to analyze, sort it out. And these are sorting out the uh, postal history of that period of Durban, because that was the next stage uh, that was close to Lorenzo Marx, closer than Cape Town. And therefore, these covers are about a crossroad during a period of the war. Yeah, I see. So uh, I remember you telling me that from an envelope, each envelope had, would have its own story. Yes, absolutely. And you could tell me all sorts of things about uh, about the envelope, the cover, I think, yes. from, uh, from its stamp or yes. or uh, things that have been added to it since... Well, it to give you, a, you know, be impossible, it would take 50 years for me to tell you. But take this, for instance. Here's one here. Now I've got to put my glasses on. No, I'm not quite so pretty with my glasses on. But this is from Johannesburg on the Transvaal South African Republic uh, stamp adhesive before Britain got to Johannesburg. So they're their original stamps. Once we got there, they made um, them overprint them VRI, which referred to that poor, stupid queen, Victoria, VRI, mm -hmm. to show our arrogance that they no longer were free to have their own stamps um, once they were occupied. And it's addressed to, where is it addressed to? Where's that? London? London. England, that's right. Look at that. Standard Bank. You see, money, money, money. Panic, yeah. panic, panic. Uh, London, England. Very bad writing, isn't it? Yes. But it's addressed there, and what's happened to it is that it was censored with this pink censor mark here by the Boers in Johannesburg, or perhaps Pretoria, which is close by. Right. That's uh, in Afrikaans, you see. And then when it got to Durban eventually, on its way to London, and how it got there is how it got from Boer territory to British territory is what I haven't analyzed this for yet. Right. But it'd be an interesting story. It then was censored by the British. And this label here, this white label there with VR on it, a badge of disgrace, a, it was opened and re-censored and stamped that it had been censored in Durban. There's that hand stamp there, hand stamp there. Mm -hmm. And then the censors initialed it in that blue pencil, you see. A bit of it. That's how it carried over. That's how it's, uh, you know, it's an analysis. And it's got the back stamps, the transit marks, says Durban, the towel, 25th of December, 1899. October, November, December, a couple of months after the war broke out. And then it arrived in London on that postmark, 26th of January, 1900. It's the Durban mark, there, see. So it tells the whole story of the war, about money, about our national disgrace. Oh, um, they're all about that, but 30,000 of them, some not as interesting as that. You must have been one of the first, surely, to have found this its subject interesting. No, 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 no. People were doing it at the time, ah. while the war was being fought. Really? Collecting them? Yes, and here's one that's been uh, censored uh, by the Boers, that white censor seal there in Afrikaans. And it gets to Durban, and there it receives a hand stamp. Stopped by censor. Return to sender. He ain't gonna get it. Mm. But, you know, if you look at the truth, oh, it's the same for India and Indians, and for English people, you know, and for Welsh people like me. If you do look at ourselves, and why? 
we did it. And this is evidence of why, why we did and what we did in that war. It's fascinating to me what a hundred years later and helps me no end. But we are a disgraceful breed of animal. And I think St. Paul had it right. The love of man is the root of all human. He didn't say he knew he was talking to all evil. I think it's absolutely true. What we're going to do about it is precious little. You know, we give all sorts of reasons for doing things. We've got, not only have we got British troops, about 15,000 at this moment in the six counties of Northern Ireland, armed to the teeth. And if a thousand young men come forward and hold up their hands and join the IRA, we call them rat scum. Bloody heroes fighting back this massive power we've withdrawn from India. But in a piece I was asked to write, of course, it's a very dangerous thing to ask me to do anything. A few months ago, before it was, I said uh, about Sierra Leone, where we have troops now, we announced that we were going to help the British subjects to get out. They're still there. They're growing in numbers, and I rather naughtily asked the question in this, some cynical people would ask, are there diamonds? Mm -hmm. I think it was cut from the art. You know, we're a lying, cheating, shallow people. So are the Germans, so are the French, so are the Chinese, and many Indians. This is very interesting, uh, because in doing what I'm doing with the personal history, um, of that war, I have to use many, many war maps, maps of the Second Anglo Boer War, and there are many of them, many. But this was given to Field Marshal, the Right Honorable Lord Roberts, Commander in Chief, with the compiler's compliments. And it's bound in khaki, and when Lord Roberts had finished, fighting the Anglo-Boer War, the Second Anglo-Boer War, the compilers got together all the maps he used in fighting the war, had them bound in khaki, this is it. So I use these. These are the very maps that Lord Roberts used to fight the war. And uh, I use them in, because they are the most detailed that exist. A farms are noted on them. You see, there are different areas. That's the Bloemfontein area, it says so there. The Tule, both in the Free State. Uh, they are the most detailed maps of that period that could exist. And the interesting thing is that their Lord Roberts, day after day, fighting that terrible war, used these maps. And I sit up here in Islington uh, doing my postal history using the same maps and in a way for the same reason, to find out in detail where places were. 100 years later? Yeah. Mm. Uh, that's it. Thank you. OK. Is their great general, Christian de Vett. All farmers, you know, but they turned out to be uh, uh, a number of them very great soldiers guerrilla soldiers, guerrilla fighters. Uh, next to him is Danny Teron, who was uh, Afrikaners seeing this or listening to it must forgive some of my pronunciation. I don't speak Afrikaans. But Danny Teron was one of their heroes. The woman next to him, I'm very relieved to say, is an English woman and the one truly great hero that Britain produced during the war. Her name is Emily Hobhouse, and she did what she could to uh, stop the deaths of uh, the Boer children. In our hands, the Boers, who are not a big nation, lost 25,000 children so that England could get the gold under Johannesburg. And I don't like it. I'm very eccentric, but I really don't like it. And next to her, 
is uh, De La Rey, another uh, farmer who became a guerrilla fighting general. Great soldier. Played havoc. They didn't, uh, we sent very nearly half a million imperial troops there, between 450,000 and half a million. They were able to send into the field 50 odd thousand farmers and uh, they were still defeating us and giving us a bad time after nearly three years. The only way we could beat them was to burn the land, burn their farms down and put the women and children into what we unhappily call concentration camps. And it's unfair to equate our concentration camps with the Nazi concentration camps. Or Roberts and a Boer War advertisement for a, I presume, an insurance company, Kitchener, particularly an attractive man. This is uh, General Hector MacDonald, great hero of the Boer War, fighting Mac, who was publicly disgraced because they accused him of homosexuality. An interesting story about uh, Hector MacDonald was um, um, a remarkable soldier, contemporary soldier, though he's dead now, Field Marshal Sir Gerald Templer, isn't it? He was the, uh, he led the British Army in the guerrilla war in Malaya, and uh, I think it's true to say the only Western military leader who was victorious against communists. We've never beaten them. And uh, we did in Malaya, and uh, he came to visit me to look at uh, uh, this, uh, this collection. And uh, I wasn't in this house at that time, uh, but I was showing him around and uh, he turned a corner and came face to face with uh, Hector MacDonald and his difficult to pin down reputation. And he froze. I had by my side behind the field marshal um, the then director of the Our National Army Museum. And uh, we. The field marshal froze looking at, I didn't know what he was going to say. He would know about his history. And suddenly he swung round to the director, very nice man, and said, Hector MacDonald, what a splendid soldier. We did an utterly disgraceful thing. We accused him of homosexuality. And he shot himself dead. In fact, what the field marshal said to the director, we accused him of buggery, is what he said. And uh, he exposed his, so I've liked the field marshal very much from that moment. I happened to be, in case, uh, I happened to be, I was uh, quite a notorious heterosexual. Now retired from the field, hurt, and very old. <laughs> but so, uh, I mean, uh, you know, these prejudices, uh, bitterly cruel and ignorant, in my opinion, and the field marshal knew that. So I'm very fond of him. The mementos of, uh, of uh, my interest in uh, Irish republicanism, uh, that's a replica, very carefully made, of the most famous flag in Ireland. It's in the, people think I've nicked it when they see it because it's very carefully made. I made a film on the life of that man there, Michael Collins. And uh, when we showed the credits at the end, we had that flag flying in the wind, that uh, Irish Republican flag, and the credits went across it. And uh, my boss at that time was Lord Grey, and Lord Grey offered me all sorts of attractive temptations if I just keep my mouth shut about the British government. Surprise.